This is Pony Prepper Bill. Today is Monday, August 3rd, 2020. We've all been played. This is a lie. This has all been planned and predicted years and months before the COVID came. Here's a bunch of clips coming up. We are in a live simulation. And here's the proof. Mooey, 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 mooey. Okay, here we go. First thing, the headline. DC mayor exempts John Lewis funeral attendees from city's quarantine restrictions. You and I and our loved ones, we can't have a funeral. We can't have gatherings. Uh, it's, this is a pandemic. There's quarantines, there are lockdowns. If you need to go to another state for anything, you need to go to a lockdown or a quarantine for 14 days. But, for our government officials, it does not apply. Us citizens, we need to follow the guidelines, but for them, everything is waived. The headline, DC Mayor Exempts John Lewis Funeral Attendees from City's Quarantine Restrictions. Lawmakers who attended the funeral of late Republican John Lewis in Atlanta earlier this week are exempt from Washington, D.C.'s self-quarantine restrictions, according to District Mayor Muriel Bowser's office. According to the mayor's July 24 order titled, Requirement to Self-Quarantine After Non-Essential Travel During a COVID-19 Public Health Emergency, any residents who travel to high-risk areas for non-essential reasons must self-quarantine for 14 days and monitor themselves for symptoms of the virus. Regarding why attendees at Lewis's funeral escaped the, re the strictures of self-quarantine, Bowser Press Secretary Susanna Costello characterized the ceremony as an essential government acti activity, telling Justin News on Friday, government activity is essential and the capital of the United States is exempt from the mayor's order. The mayor's office still deems the funerals of regular people, non-essential activity, however, when asked whether attendees of non-government funerals in high-risk areas are still required to self-quarantine under the mayor's order, Costello responded simply yes. Members of Congress are also exempt from Bowser's recent edict mandating D.C. residents wear masks both in public indoor spaces and even outside if they are likely to come in contact with another person, such as being within six feet of, an, of another person for more than a fleeting time. Those who neglect to cover up expose themselves to the possibility of fines up to $1,000 per violation. So we can't go to funerals, we can't go to the hospital to see a, you know, a, a relative in a hospital. Uh, we, the citizens, the public are deemed non-essential. If a governor or a mayor or something like that gets sick and goes to the hospital, they're allowed to see him. Uh, if they have a funeral, if he dies, if he or she dies, they can have funerals and it doesn't matter. We are non-essential. So this is all bullshit. We've all been played. Oh, here comes the pig. Hey, Moo. We've all been played. This. There is no virus. People aren't dying from this. People are dying from everyday, normal day, flus and all this other stuff. And we've all been played. You know, I mean, it's bullshit. Uh, there is no virus. The vaccines are what's going to kill us. And I'm even going to put a thing up here. Here's Bill Gates saying how many people are going to die from the vaccine. The vaccine won't work. Thousands of people are going to die from the vaccine. 
The efficacy of vaccines in older people is always a huge challenge. You know, it turns out the flu vaccine uh, isn't that effective in elderly people. Most of the benefit comes from younger people not uh, spreading it because they're vaccinated, and that, that benefits on a community basis the elderly. Here, we clearly need a vaccine that works in the upper age range because they're uh, most at, at risk of that. And doing that so that you amp it up so it works in older people and yet you don't have side effects. You know, if we have, you know, one in 10,000 uh, side effects, that's, you know, way more, 700,000, uh, you know, people who will suffer from that. So really understanding the safety at gigantic scale across all age ranges, you know, pregnant, male, female, undernourished, uh, existing comorbidities, it's very, very hard. And that actual decision of, okay, let's go and give this vaccine to the entire world, uh, governments will have to be involved because there will be some risk and indemnification needed before that can uh, be decided on. Here, Fucci, Fauci, whatever his name is, they've talked about and predicted this pandemic for a long time. Bill Gates talked about it. Event 201, this whole thing, this is the exercise. They had Event 201 right before this outbreak. They predicted it. Bill Gates talked about having vaccines way before all this happened. Fauci, he's in on it. They're all in on it. And, you know, if you're still falling for this bullshit, we got to stop. You know, people are dying from the mass. People are dying. Nobody's dying from this virus. It's all other stuff. It's heart attack. It's heart disease. It's liver problems. It's stroke. There is, they're dying from the flu. They're dying from whatever. They're dying from car accidents. They're not dying from COVID-19. People wake up. We got to start getting this stuff. We got to get this country back. We got to take the world back. You know, this is a worldwide bullshit. There will be a surprise outbreak. Given, as you heard from the introduction, that I have been around for a while and have had the opportunity and, and the privilege and the pleasure of serving in five administrations, um, I thought I would bring that perspective to the topic today is the issue of pandemic uh, preparedness. And if there's one message that I want to leave with you today based on my experience, and you'll see that in a moment, is that there is no question that there will be a challenge to the coming administration in the arena of infectious diseases, both chronic infectious diseases in the sense of already ongoing disease, and we have certainly a large burden of that, but also there will be a surprise outbreak. And I hope by the end of my relatively short presentation, you will understand why history, the history of the last 32 years that I've been the director of NIAID will tell the next administration that there's no doubt in anyone's mind that they will be faced with the challenges that their predecessors were faced with. So for those who think that infectious diseases is gone, there's so many people who've made foolhardy statements not knowing at the time that they made them. I usually show a quote from an old surgeon general or an old uh, pundit in infectious disease. So I thought I'd pull this one out from Sir McFarlane Burnett, who was actually a uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning immunologist uh, who made the statement, as many did, to write about infectious diseases is almost to write of something that has passed into history. The most likely forecast about the future of infectious diseases is that it will be very dull, uh, which is really kind of interesting coming from a semi-genius like McFarlane Burnett. And I think what he did in the mistake that so many people have made is something that several of our panelists have already referred to. And that is a failure to look beyond our own borders in the issue of the globality of health issues. Not only things that are there that will come here, but surprises that we have. What are the lessons that we learned from HIV? One, you have to commit substantial financial and human resources. These things don't get uh, addressed spontaneously by themselves. You have to enlist the best and the brightest investigators in both basic and clinical research. You have to involve the community, be it the gay community in the United States 
or the community in Africa and West Africa when we dealt with Ebola, or the people in South America when we're dealing with Zika. You have to have cross-sector collaboration. You can't do it alone. The CDC can't do it alone. The NIH can't do it alone. You do it with all of us, with industry, with global organizations, with philanthropy and NGOs. And you got to get the leaders and the policymakers involved. What is for sure that no matter what, history has told us definitively that it will happen because infectious diseases, as I said eight years ago in this article with David Morins and Greg uh, Fokers, that it is a perpetual challenge. It is not going to go away. So the thing we're extraordinarily confident about is that we are going to see this in the next few years. Thank you. So, was that coincidence? Here's Bill Gates. Here's Bill Gates talking about needing a vaccine and a possible pandemic coming. I think uh, an epidemic, either naturally caused or intentionally caused, is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess deaths. Uh, and that it's pretty surprising how little preparedness there is for it. Now, it's tricky because this is a global problem, so you know, how do countries work together, which countries should put up what resources, uh, and you know, every aspect of it, the, uh, the resources to go engage in the, the affected countries, the allocation decisions. As we've seen various flu scares come along, uh, we haven't had a, a super good response. So the paradigmatic examples are uh, smallpox for an intentionally caused thing, that there was a simulation called Dark Winter that didn't come out very well, uh, i.e. smallpox scored one and humanity scored zero. Okay, here's Bill and Melinda Gates talking about the second wave. People, I guess, don't believe in this COVID because we don't, because there's no such thing to believe in. But look at the expression on Bill Gates' face. Do you, would you take a vaccine from this monster in fact the testing could have been ramped up uh very quickly in a few countries that have almost avoided the epidemic entirely like uh taiwan new zealand australia you know they took their experience and actually prepared and so they moved a lot faster uh so we you know we'll have to prepare for the next one that you know i'd say is uh will get attention this time. Here's the thing on event 201. Before all this bullshit started, like a couple months, this is a, I mean, event 201, there's all kinds of stuff on the internet. You can download hours and hours of the whole event 201. But here's a, a quick thing on event 201. began in healthy looking pigs months, perhaps years ago. A new coronavirus spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care, many died. Experts agree, unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. The board is comprised of highly experienced leaders from business, public health, and civil society. We could be looking at double the number of cases in one week and 16 times as many in a month if we are not able to stop the spread. That would be on the order of half a million cases and it would continue to rise exponentially. In three months, we could be approaching 10 million cases. We're at the start of what's looking like it will be a severe pandemic. And there are problems emerging that can only be solved by global business and governments working together.
We have known about caps like viruses in animals and people for decades, but have not been successful at developing a licensed vaccine. And sure, there are new technologies that may help, but it's going to be difficult. I am not optimistic about having a vaccine in time to be relevant during this pandemic. So the policy crisis in question for this board in this meeting is this. How should governments, business, and international organizations allocate and distribute pandemic antivirals and medical supplies to the people who need the most? What we've seen work uh, very well in the HIV field is in fact procurement through the Global Fund. So having a centralized mechanism, so financial, financially able to procure on behalf of affected countries okay. can be critical. I think the second thing, the second thing is um, it's going to be very important that for the business sector, for manufacturers of anti antivirals, that we have clarity around what the need is and where the need is and who are making the decisions. I think that given that uh, the countries most affected are those that are low and middle income countries with unequal access to technology, to, to finances, uh, the UN has a, a worldwide uh, footprint, universally uh, recognized and uh, universal membership. A global stockpile would certainly help ensure more rational and strategic allocation, but the reality is that we don't have the logistics capability, even within the UN, to bring that together in one place and run it. So this is where I think a collaboration between the international organizations like the World Health Organization and the private sector, which runs these supply chains for many purposes every day. Understand where the supplies are, make smart decisions about how to allocate them to the people who need them in the places that need them the most, and then work with the industry to move those supplies from where they are today to where they need to be. Just to underscore the point that cooperation among supply chain providers or businesses that have huge supply chains mm -hmm. can add a lot of efficiency to the whole process. The question is, can you, through this international mechanism, really promote commitments to doing this as quickly as possible and give people a sense that actually if they contribute more, that they will have a, a better chance of protecting their own populations and their country's security and health. So to be completely clear, most uh, of this production would already be committed in contracts. Yes. Uh, it is almost unheard of that people are producing product without having a forward commitment for the consumption of that product. So the first thing that needs to be done, because this is not something that the countries currently control, unless countries are going to bring about emergency situations and co-opt an existing supply chain. I think it's not likely, I agree, that, that countries are not going to buy, uh, buy a countermeasure to put into a global supply without retaining a large portion of it for themselves. Public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been canceled. A ripple effect is racing through the service sector. Governments that rely on travel and tourism as a large part of their economies are being hit particularly hard. How should national leaders businesses and international organizations balance the risk of worsening disease that would be caused by the continued movement of people around the world against the risks of profound economic consequence of travel and trade bans. If there's some sense that there's a UN institution that can do all of this, mm -hmm. then I, I, I worry we're suffering from a delusional disorder mm -hmm. on the power of the UN. Uh, it's really important to get those industries and their trade associations and a, an efficient leadership established, which is decentralized, uh, but has a collective responsibility and accountability. And that needs to be supported by um, the public uh, leadership. What is essential, what is non-essential travel, we have to clarify this. Otherwise, if we go down to 20% bookings over a long period, the company will run down. That's a fact. You know, there's a whole complex set of issues in a highly interdependent world on supply chains that are just in time. We need to think about how much flex there is in that just in time supply chain system and make sure it keeps running. I think it's going to take specificity and it's going to take knowledge that only the private sector has. 
The UN can play an important coordinating facilitation role, but the companies know where those commodities are, where they move, how to move them, and that's where a, a, a type of public-private collaboration that we have not generally had in these crises needs to be put together pretty quickly. We are not out of money, yet. But the fact is we are trending in a dangerous direction and something needs to change. So the policy question for this board now is how should financial resources be prioritized? Are there nodes that we cannot allow to fail? What is your sense of priorities? We don't have money to pay for all of these urgent problems. So at the moment, we want the funds, right? You need the money. So where's the money? So government kind of supplies some money. A lot of, you know, private sectors, you know, some are sitting here, you have some money. But now you need a really coordinated, centralized efforts. Hotels will be, will be experiencing, you know, crippling losses during that. And we know that the hotel business in itself makes up 5% of the GDP. Governments need to be willing to do things that are out of their historical perspective. Or, for the most part, it's, it's really a, a war footing that we need to be on. We shouldn't underestimate the uh, power of entrepreneurship. We need to escalate that, whether it's through you know, the governments um, helping with tax breaks or you know, subsidies of that nature to, to, to increase manufacturing of those types of products. It can happen quickly. A Marshall-type plan, uh, you know, I don't mean to say that exactly, but a Marshall plan that can go into effect uh, can stimulate uh, change very quickly. Countries are reacting in different ways as to how best to manage the overwhelming amounts of dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. In some cases, limited internet shutdowns are being implemented to quell panic. How much control of information should there be? And by whom? And how can false information be effectively challenged? And what if that false information is coming from companies or from governments? I think it's very important that we make sure that there is concise communication with all healthcare facilities where these patients are being treated so that there isn't mass panic. We're at a moment where the social media platforms have to step forward and recognize the moment to assert that they're a technology platform and not a broadcaster is, is over. Um, they, in fact, have to be a participant in broadcasting accurate information and partnering with the scientific and health communities mm -hmm. to counterweight, if not flood the zone, of accurate information. Because to, try to put the genie back in the bottle of the misinformation and disinformation is nigh impossible. One thing we haven't spoken about, and I'm wondering whether it's time to talk about this, is uh, a step up from the part of the governments on enforcement actions against fake news. I personally do not believe that trying to shut things down in terms of information is either practical or desirable. And we do have, I think, a, a couple of strategies that are available to us, one of which is the flood strategy, second of which is relying and informing and equipping trusted uh, sources of information with the facts so they can then pass that on. But we also need to actually think about a technological answer to this. The outcome of the CAPS pandemic in Event 201 was catastrophic. 65 million people died in the first 18 months. The outbreak was small at first and initially seemed controllable, but then it started spreading in densely crowded and impoverished neighborhoods of megacities. From that point on, the spread of the disease was explosive. Within six months, cases were occurring in nearly every country. The global economy was in a free fall the GDP down 11 percent. Stock markets around the world plummeted between 20 and 40 percent and headed into a downward cycle of fear and low expectation. Businesses were not borrowing, banks were not lending, everyone was just hoping to hunker down and weather the storm. Economists say the economic turmoil caused by such a pandemic will last for years, perhaps a decade. The societal impacts, the loss of faith in government, the distrust of news, and the breakdown of social cohesion could last even longer. We have to ask, did this need to be so bad? Are there things we could have done in the five to ten years leading up to the pandemic that would have lessened the catastrophic consequences? We believe the answer is yes. So are we, as a global community, now finally ready to do the hard work 
needed to prepare for the next pandemic. I was reading comments on somebody else's video and this guy's uncle, you know, his favorite uncle, they do all kinds of stuff together. Well, the kid doesn't really believe in this virus. He just wears a mask going in and out of the store like we all do. And his uncle told him that there was something wrong with him. He's not taking this virus seriously. People are dying and that he needs to start wearing a mask and doing all the stuff he's supposed to be doing. He says, you're not taking it serious. You're going to kill other people. And he said, if you don't take it serious, I hope you get to COVID-19 and die. And I'm going to piss on your grave. This is a family member. I I'm seeing it. I mean, I don't, I'm not on Facebook, but I hear other people talking about stuff on Facebook and going back and forth and Twitter and Instagram. And they're playing us. They are divide and conquer. They are dividing us, family members against family members. You know, flat earth, round earth, you know, flat tard, round tard, or globe tard, and all this stuff. And it doesn't matter. Black lives matter. Just, just defunding the police. And last year, the year before, it was blue lives matter. And the white, the black, the Hispanics. Oh, get the wall built. You know, oh, we got, oh, there's, you know, caravans coming. We got to stop all this. And do you hear anything about that anymore? None of it. It's all a scam. I mean, do you hear anything about the caravan? Do you hear anything about the wall? None of it. Do you hear about, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton, you know, getting arrested? All that shit is gone. Come and goes. It, all that stuff, it comes and goes. It's, it's old news. It doesn't matter. Now everything is vaccines. You're an anti-vaxxer. You're, you know, against Black Lives Matter. You're against this. You're against that. You're against the mask. We all got to stop. This whole thing is bullshit. It's divide and conquer. They've been doing it for centuries. For centuries. They want us all, all in stack and packs. The businesses are closing. Small businesses aren't coming back. They're not. And all that land, the township's going to take it because nobody's going to be paying rent. A lot of people I know aren't going back to their offices. They're, they're working from home. And when all this supposedly is over and the new norm... Oh yeah, well I'm not going to pay $1,200, $1,500 a month for a little storefront or for an office. I'm going to save that money and work at home. A lot of people are going to be doing that. All these things are going to be stacking packs. And I see them everywhere for the last two years. Stacking packs everywhere. I'm like, who would live in that? Well, you know what? We might not have a choice. I live out here in the middle of nowhere. And they're going to try and make it so you can't live out here. And this one place, is it uh, Victoria? Australia? The stay-at-home restrictions for Metro Melbourne will be enhanced. There will be additional limits uh, to the four reasons to leave home. Strength through unity. You will no longer be able to leave home or go any further away from your home than a five kilometre radius. You will not be able to be at any point more than five kilometres away from your home. Unity through faith. Only one person will be able to go shopping once per day and they will need to secure the goods and services that are what you need uh, within a five kilometre radius. Recreational activity is now no longer uh, allowed. Uh, you will be allowed to have one hour of exercise no further than five kilometres from your home and there will no longer be able to be any groups bigger than two regardless of whether they are from your family or someone else. When it comes to shopping one person goes out once a day and stays close to home within 5Ks. Uh, when it comes to exercise, it's no longer three sets of tennis or a game of golf or, or any of that. It is staying close to home uh, and, and only once per day and only one person. Ultimately, all of these changes are about limiting movement. We did what we had to do. All of these changes are about limiting the number of people that we come in contact with. Daily exercise is just that. It's not an opportunity to live our lives as if this pandemic was not real and was not here and was not literally the biggest challenge we've perhaps ever faced. I just want to be clear these, these changes 
These changes are about making sure uh, that we limit movement, that we have less people moving around. There's a power of work being done around uh, changes to some employment, uh, some some employee em employment um, uh, places of work. I should say there will be significant changes to a number of workplaces. Some will close and under those stated disaster provisions from 8 p.m. tonight. A curfew will be uh, implemented. So there will be a curfew across metropolitan Melbourne from 8 p.m. this evening, and it will run from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. each and every day. A yellow coded curfew is now in effect. A yellow coded curfew is now in effect. A yellow coded curfew, coded curfew is now in effect. And the only reason to be out of your home between the hours of 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. is to get care, to give care or to go to and from work or be at work. Uh, we can no longer have people uh, visiting others. Any unauthorised personnel will be subject to arrest. We can no longer have people simply out and about uh, for no good reason whatsoever. This is for your protection. Uh, it is not an easy decision to make, but it is the decision that is necessary and that is why I have made it. We did what we had to do. Uh, and that's why uh, police will be out in force and you will be stopped and you will be asked and you will need to demonstrate that you are lawfully out and that you are not breaching that curfew. Whoa! Excuse me, miss. I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Are in a hurry, are we? I was just... It's past curfew, you know. My uncle, he's very sick. Oh, sick uncle, is it? What do you think on that, Willie? It's a load of bollocks, what I think. Going to a mate's place, uh, going and visiting friends, uh, being out and about for no good reason, all that will do is spread this virus. Yeah. Only one person is allowed out of the house to go shopping for everybody in the house, but you're only allowed to go three miles. It's like five kilometers, which is three miles. There's nothing around here for 15 miles. You're not allowed out of the house at all. I think you're allowed out one person at a time for one hour a day to exercise. And they have police watching. If you're outside, they're gonna ask you what you're doing outside. Only one person to the store at a time. Husband and wife, no, can't go together. If you have a kid, somebody's got to stay home and watch a kid, you're not allowed out. Are you kidding me? All that's going to come here. This is all bullshit, people. we got to stop, stop the, the black, the white, the, all the racial shit and the mask. You need to wear a mask. You shouldn't wear a mask. We need to stop all this bullshit and get back to normal. Not the normal, new normal that they want. we gotta, we got to wake up. This is, this is going to get worse. Well, this is Pony Prepper Bill. That's what I got for now. Like, subscribe, and in the comments below, let me know what you think. What's your take on all this bullshit? Thanks. Bye-bye.